So yeah, I'm super excited to, to present uh, a, a new paper I have with uh, Emilien Gouin-Bonenfant at uh, Columbia University. Uh, and so the paper is called Q Theory of Inequality. Um, so the main motivation of a paper is the recent rise in top of inequality. Um, and in particular, uh, the main status fact among like a lot of different studies is that uh, the rise in top of inequality is concentrated at the very top of the world distribution. And so you have like the top 0.1% that increase more than the top 0.1, that increase more than the top 1%, that increase more than the top 10%. So uh, another way to say that is that um, the super rich have pulled ahead relative to uh, the rich. Uh, and so we call that a fattening of the right tail of the wealth distribution. And so another question is what determines the right tail of uh, the wealth distribution? And so the classical view is that it's determined by the level of the interest rate. Uh, and in particular, this idea goes back to a seminal paper by Wall and Riddle uh, in 1957. Uh, and, you know, it has been at the heart of the wealth inequality literature and it has been recently revived by Piketty, in particular in his book and in, in a paper with Zuckman. Uh, and so the idea is that a high interest rate uh, tends to uh, thicken the, the, the right tail of the distribution and the intuition is that high rates increase the growth, the growth rate of um, people at the top of the wealth distribution relative to the economy. So what we are going to argue in our paper is that uh, we're going to overturn the, this, uh, this idea and we're going to show that actually low rates can actually increase top wealth inequality. And the idea is that, um, you know, as, as uh, the existing literature says, it's true that low rates decrease uh, the growth rate of existing fortunes. But the important thing is that low rates can actually increase the growth rate of new fortunes. And, uh, you know, to take a simple example, let's think about like people at the top of the world distribution, like people like Bezos. Uh, and these are the kind of people that actually benefited from low rates. Why? Because low rates increase the valuation of Amazon, allowing Bezos to uh, issue uh, equity and also debt at, uh, uh, for cheap. Uh, and so basically to be able to grow his firm without getting diluted in the process. Um, and so this, this effect of, uh, this redistributive effect of low interest rate is going to be at the heart of our paper. Um, so that's, we, we're going to start with a simple status model to, to show this fact, but actually we also want to go to the data and actually try to quantify the effect of low rates on the, the right tail of the world distribution. And so we're going to have a general model where agents start as entrepreneurs with concentrated portfolio in their firms. That is, they have to invest all of their wealth in their firms. Uh, and these entrepreneurs are going to transition to rentiers, rentiers as uh, the firms matter. Uh, and so we're going to, to prove a sufficient statistic for the effect of low rates on the Pareto hotel. And it's going to depend on uh, the extent to which entrepreneurs arriving in the right tail of the distribution um, depend on outside uh, funding. And so in particular, it's going to depend on the equity payout yield that measures uh, the level of equity issuance and also the leverage of the firms owned by top entrepreneurs, okay? Um, in, a word, in, a, in a world in which uh, people getting to the top of the distribution own firms that uh, issued a lot of equity or that are, that are very leveraged, we're going to have like a large effect of lower rates on uh, Pareto inequality. All right, uh, and uh, what we're going to do is bring this sufficient study to the data. And uh, you know, one contribution of the paper is to collect new data on the whole wealth trajectory of top entrepreneurs. Usually if you uh, look at uh, most of the existing empirical results on inequality, they really focus on uh, only like, um, uh, you know, looking at the rich people and what they do. What we look is, we, we look at the whole trajectory before becoming rich. And uh, we're going to show that all of this, you know, it's, it's important to look at this whole trajectory to look at the effect of interest rates on uh, wealth inequality. Uh, and so our main quantitative result is that uh, the effect of uh, low rates is actually high. Uh, we show that a 5% decline in rates can extend uh, three quarter of the rise in top wealth inequality. Uh, all right, so uh, that's the uh, main, uh, uh, main ideas of the paper. And so let me uh, get into more details. We're going to start with the most simplest model to, to, to see uh, uh, our idea. Uh, and so it's going to be a model where there's a continuum of agents. Uh, population grows at rate eta. So we need some kind of population growth so that uh, well, the wealth distribution remains stationary. So there's some, like, some kind of renewal of the population. 
Uh, new agents are born as entrepreneurs, and so they are done, endowed with a tree. And uh, the, the thing that is going to be uh, really key in the model is that trees require outside investment to grow. Okay, so that, these are not like the trees that give Apple uh, every uh, period. It's trees that first, they require actually some uh, cash flow, uh, some investment to grow, and at some point they blow some, and that's at this point they give out uh, their, their fruits. So eventually trees blossom, and at this point entrepreneurs uh, invest all the proceeds into a diversified portfolio uh, and they become volunteers. And so this very simple um, uh, framework is like really like this, the, the two ideas, which is that there are like both uh, entrepreneurs and volunteers. All right, so let's go into more details. Trees have an initial size of one, and so as I told you, they require some investment to grow. And so uh, we're going to say that investment is proportional to their size, and it's going to be uh, I is a coefficient of proportionality between the flow of investment that you need uh, for, the firm, for the tree to grow and uh, the size of the tree. Trees, if they, um, you know, if you invest in the trees, the tree is going to grow at a rapid uh, rate D. And then at some point, the tree blossoms with hard rate delta giving a one-time dividend. And so once the tree blossoms, it disappears. Uh, and so formally, the, you, know, you can look at the instantan instantaneous cash flow of the tree uh, as like first it's negative, while the tr tree is still growing. Uh, the cash flow of the tree is minus i uh, times the size of the tree, ETT. And then as the tree blossoms, it gives a dividend flow that is exactly equal to its size, which is ETT. And then afterward, it's, it's zero. Uh, so, you know, of course, uh, th this very simple modeling trick is a way for us to talk about uh, the kind of firms that are owned by people getting to the top of the world distribution, which are, you know, if you think about um, Amazon or Apple or Uber, these are firms that require a lot of uh, investment uh, to grow. They grow very high, but they require a lot of uh, outside financing, both through debt and uh, equity. And, you know, they have like very long maturity and it's only at after uh, a point that they're going to give out some uh, dividends to their shareholders. All right, so um, let's think about the effect of the interest rate in this uh, model. So I'm going to denote R the interest rate. I'm going to think of it as exogenous for now. Uh, you know, you can think of an um, uh, open economy, but uh, you know, actually we have a, a in, in the paper, we also uh, make, make the interest rate endogenous, uh, but you know, it's just simpler to, to, to see as fixed right now. Um, so the valuation of the tree is going to be proportional to its size. Um, and so there's a, uh, we're going to denote Q, the market to book ratio of the tree, which is the ratio between the value of the tree, market value of the tree, and its size. And Q is going to pin down by uh, market pricing and it's going to depend on the interest rate. Um, so the equation giving Q is just like the market pricing condition. And what it says is that uh, the average return of holding the tree must equal R, right? Uh, especially because you know all the risk of holding the tree is idiosyncratic, so you know uh, investors don't require uh, compensation to hold this idiosyncratic uh, uh, risk. So on the left hand side is the average return of the tree, which must equal R, and this average return is the sum of two different returns. So the first one is the return of the tree conditional on growing. So if the tree keeps growing. Uh, the return of the tree is the dividend yield. So here the dividend yield is negative because uh, while the tree is still growing, the, uh, the tree gives negative dividend. So it's minus I over Q plus a capital gain, which is the growth rate of the tree, G. Okay, uh, so again, like think of G being very high. Uh, you know, the return conditional on growing is going to be uh, pretty high as long as G is much higher than I. Um, so, uh, and then there's a, so, you know, we like to see this return as you know, the dividend yield minus I over Q plus G, um, uh, dividend, dividend yield plus capital gain. There's another way we can see this return conditional on growing, and the way we, we prefer to see it is actually you can see it as a growth rate of the tree, G, minus a wedge, which is minus I over Q, which represents the dilution that happens when uh, the existing shareholders issue new shares to uh, finance the, um, uh, the growth of the tree. So if you think about it, the tree grows at G, but every period uh, the, the existing shareholders need to, to issue outside shares uh, and to, to, to get some outside investments so the tree keeps growing. Uh, and so by doing that, of course, the existing shareholders uh, become uh, diluted and minus I over Q is exactly how much uh, existing shareholders get diluted per unit of time. 
All right, so that's the return condition on growing. Of course, if the tree uh, blossoms, then you know, the, the tree is just transformed into output, and so the, the, the market to book ratio jumps to one. And so the return in this case is delta. The, so delta is the probability that the, firm, that, uh, the, the tree blossoms. And if it blossoms, the return is one over Q minus one. Um, and so of course, so these two returns must equal the, the interest rate, and so that pins down the value of Q. Okay, so of course, like as is usual, uh, the value of Q is decreasing in R. Uh, but the thing that is interesting here is that if you think about what happened when R decreases, that's going to decrease the average return of a tree, but that's going also to change the distribution of ex post returns. And in particular, it's going to increase the return of the tree conditional on growing. Intuitively, lower R means higher Q, higher valuation, which means that existing shareholders get less diluted as the tree keeps growing, okay? Uh, so it's just much cheap, like when interest rates are low, it's just much cheaper for existing shareholders to, uh, um, to, to raise uh, outside capital. And so uh, their returns is actually higher. And so that happened exactly uh, only if, actually if or only if the uh, dividend yield is negative. So that's why it's very important for our model. All right, so we talked about the tree. Now let's talk about the uh, agents in the economy. So agents are going to start as entrepreneurs. And so they, they must invest in their trees until it blossoms. So agents, you know, they can fully issue new shares to uh, uh, outside investors, but they have to invest all of their wealth into the tree. They don't have to own all, those, all of their tree though. Um, then at some points, uh, when the tree blossoms, uh, agents then become volunteers. And at this point, they collect the proceed and the, of the tree and they invest in a diversified portfolios of trees. Okay, and in particular, they're going to be the one that invests in the tree that buy the, um, uh, the, the shares that are sold by entrepreneurs with trees that keep growing. Uh, just to, to make them all uh, as simple as possible, so that agents have log utility, which basically means that the growth rate of their wealth is the return of, the, uh, of their portfolio minus rho, uh, which is their consumption rate. And so the law of motion of individual wealth is going to be very simple. As the age, while this tree is still growing, the agent is still an entrepreneur. And so the growth rate of, of wealth is going to be minus i over q plus g, which is the return of the tree conditional on growing, minus rho. When the tree blossoms, the return is going to be one over q minus one. And afterwards, uh, agents are rentiers. Uh, they invest in a diversified portfolio of trees. And so their return is the average return of a tree, which is r. Um, and so the, the growth rate is R minus one. And so the thing that is key here is that if you think about a lower interest rate, that's going to decrease the growth rate of rentiers, but that's going to increase the growth rate of entrepreneurs. Mathieu, can, can, I, can I just, uh, for, for, um, for interpretation, I think some, somebody also raised this, this point and maybe it's good for you to, to clear it. Um, being uh, in in this understanding of the model what really um there's a conjunction of two things one of them is the fact that the entrepreneur is fully invested in in the asset and the other one is that the asset keeps growing and um it it, it doesn't require and when you go to the full model in particular the asset i, I think keeps growing nevertheless it's just that the decision is going to be one of of diversifying so what i i'll let you say it in your in your own words uh, um to, to explain to everybody but i think it's, it's useful to understand that uh the firm doesn't have to be to be private it can go public and as long as zuckerberg or bezos etc they have a, a a concentrated stake they are still exposed to this high growth path uh that uh potentially is going to, to flatten at some point and they could still become much richer. So your, your theory is not, doesn't depend on, on staying private or the company staying private. Uh, yeah, no, not at all. Uh, actually, there's a lot of, um, so what matters is that for the effect of interest rate on the growth rate of entrepreneurs, what matters is that entrepreneurs are people that tend to raise uh, capital rather than uh, giving capital away. Uh, and so, you know, raising capital can happen uh, once when you private, uh, when you, uh, you know, when you uh, go to the bank or when you uh, issue equity to, uh, uh, from VCs. 
But it can also happen uh, once you're public uh, through the IPO, but also after the IPO in particular due to, uh, we know when you pay you, you, your employees with stocks, it's basically a way for you to, uh, to, 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 to raise some, uh, um, uh, uh, some capital, like issue stock to your own, um, to your own employees. And that's actually something that happens uh, even now uh, um, for a lot of firms after IPO. Um, now, you know, like things are going to become more complicated when uh, firms become mature, a little bit like Apple now, uh, now giving dividends uh, to shoulders. Uh, and so now, you know, um, the effect of interest rate is going to be lower. So what matters to us is if you look at the life cycle of the people that are in the top right now, if you look at the past, home, uh, in the past, what we're going to see in the data is most of the time, the firms tend to be a net equity issuers rather than net dividend issuers. And that's the thing that matters for us. Yeah, does that answer uh, the question? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, so yeah. So, w what I really want to stress here is that uh, a, a decrease in R has like heterogeneous effects. It decreases the growth rate of entier and it increases the growth rate of entrepreneurs. And so, you know, that's one way to um, um, see uh, to see it in a graph here. So, in red. So, here I've plotted the realized path of wealth of an entrepreneur with a tree that matures at age 15. Uh, and so you see that while the tree is still growing, uh, you see that the entrepreneur's wealth grows very fast. Uh, when the tree uh, blossoms, then the, uh, um, the, the wealth of the entrepreneur um, uh, jumps to one, and so uh, it's a negative return. And then going forward, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur invests in a diversified portfolio of tree, and the, so the, the, the slope of the uh, wealth is going to be R here. And so what's really important is what happened as the interest rate goes down. What you see, so here I've plotted the same thing as for a tree that matures exactly the same data, I only changed the interest rate. And what you see is that uh, the, the lower rate is going to increase the growth rate of successful entrepreneurs and is going to decrease the growth rate of volunteers. Again, the intuition is that, uh, you know, it's, it's an economy where entrepreneurs are always like selling shares of their firms to volunteers. Lower rates, that means high valuations, are useful for uh, entrepreneurs because it means that they can sell a, a lot of shares for a very high price and so they can like raise equity without getting diluted and so that increases their growth rate. On the other end, rentiers keep buying firms at inflated prices and so of course the growth rate of their wealth is going to be lower. Uh, now the question is like um, uh, how, so we, we, we focus on the redistributive effect of the interest rate between volunteers and entrepreneurs. How does it matter for uh, top wealth inequality? So let, let, let me define uh, our, our notion of inequality. So we're going to focus on Pareto inequalities that measures the thickness of the right tail of the distribution. So a distribution has a Pareto tail if the CDF of the distribution, that is the probability of wealth higher than a given uh, wealth level, evolves uh, as a power law of the wealth level. And so there is an index theta that measures the thickness of the distribution. Uh, theta is between zero and one, and theta of one means like super high level of inequality. Um, so high theta means high level of inequality. And so in our model, we have a very simple uh, uh, formula for Pareto inequality, which says that it's a max of two things. Uh, so the first uh, thing is the growth rate of entrepreneurs so, so divided by uh, their persistence, uh, so which is eta plus delta. Delta is a, a, a hazard rate by which the tree blossoms. And then the second term is the growth rate of rentier, r minus rho, divided by eta. In a way, in a, you know, it's a very simple formula because it says that you know, like two, it's a model with basically two types of agents. And it turns out that what pins down the Pareto inequality is the agent that grows the fastest. Okay. Uh, and so the, the first one is uh, entrepreneurs, the second one is volunteer. Uh, by the way, if you look at the uh, second formula, it's R minus rho over eta. That's basically what happened in a, in, a, in a model with only volunteers, like basically in a model where entrepreneurs don't have to stay exposed to their firms and they sell, they sell their firms uh, from birth. And so in this case, Pareto inequality is going to be equal to R minus rho over eta, which is exactly the wall on Riddle uh, uh, seminal formula. And it's exactly the formula that PKD refers to when he says that you know, high interest rate is going to increase Pareto inequality. What's different in the model is that we have two kinds of agents, uh, not only volunteers, but also entrepreneurs. And the interesting thing is that entrepreneur, like the effect of the interest rate is going to be inverse for entrepreneurs compared to volunteers. And indeed, the first term is going to be 
um, uh, decre decreasing in R, and the second term is increasing in R. And so there is a point at which the two intersect, and so that means that Pareto inequality is a U-shaped function of the interest rate. Uh, here is a, a plot of, that says ex it's exactly the plot of the, the formula that plots Pareto inequality theta as a function of the interest rate part. Okay? Again, I assume that I can like move the interest rate completely exogenously, but in, in, a, in the paper, we, we, uh, you know, we, we have different interest rate based on uh, the, in, the patients or patients of you know, workers, people that are not entrepreneurs, uh, outside, outside people. Uh, and so what you see is that here I've plotted uh, the first term, which is minus i over q plus g minus rho, so growth rate of entrepreneurs divided by the persistence. Uh, so you see that it's, it's declining with the interest rate. Uh, I've plotted r minus rho over eta, which is increasing with the interest rate. And so you see that uh, the Pareto inequality is a U-shaped function of the interest rate. Uh, the thing that is really interesting is that, you know, if you look at a Pareto inequality of 0 0.75, that means, you know, high level of inequality, you have two kind of level of interest rate that can give you uh, 0 0.75. The first is a high level of interest rate of like 7, 8%. And the idea is that there is a whole, in this economy, there's a lot of wealth inequality because people that own capital, like their own tiers, they can like grow their capital like very quickly because they can buy a lot of cheap firms for uh, a lot of firms for cheap. So it's very easy for them to, uh, to grow their fortunes. Uh, but we can get a super high level of interest rate of uh, Pareto inequality with very low interest rate. And so that's what happened with an interest rate around 1%. And this economy, this economy is completely different. It's an economy where rates are so low that the people reaching the right tail of the distributions are entrepreneurs, not frontiers. Uh, and so for, for them, uh, low rates are beneficial because that's going to increase uh, the growth rate. And so in this economy, we're going to see that, uh, you know, top fortunes, they grow very fast at the top of the distribution. Once they're at the top, they don't grow that fast. Uh, when they get uh, diversified and become more tiers, actually the interest rate is not that high, is actually low, so uh, they're going to decline. But still, wealth inequality is super high because of the continuum flow, continuous flow of uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, pushing uh, the top of the wealth distribution. All right, so that's a, a super stylized model just to uh, you know, really explain uh, our main idea and the effect of interest rate on Pareto inequality. Now what we want to do is quantify this insight. And we're going to do it through uh, a sufficient statistic approach. Uh, we're going to uh, have a very general model, the most general model that we think about, uh, so that we can, uh, in which we can still um, uh, quantify the effect of interest rate on Pareto inequality. So entrepreneurs are going to be born with firms, no, no longer trees. Uh, and so part in particular, firms are going to have AK technology and with convex adjustment costs. Uh, so firms, you know, are going to grow, uh, so that they're going to choose a growth rate G, and uh, to, 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 to grow at a rate G, they need to invest uh, a quantity of output, which is IT. Uh, and I is going to be a convex uh, function, and so it's really going to be uh, the, the, the usual um, Q theory of investment. Um, now, um, f the TFP of each firm is going to evolve uh, as a Markov chain. So it's going to be uh, from a, a, a discrete set, A1 to AS. Uh, and uh, it's going to evolve as an arbitrary Markov chain with an arbitrary transition matrix. So we're not going to restrict, uh, you know, in the, in the first stylized model, there's only like one kind of tree. Here there's an arbitrary amount of trees and there's an arbitrary, you know, um, transition between these different uh, uh, TFPs. And so of course, uh, firms that have a high TFP, they're going to choose to uh, grow a lot um, uh, because they have a high marginal productivity of capital. And so due to that, they're going to um, uh, require outside, outside funding. Uh, and so that's uh, um, the same thing is going to happen in this model. Uh, at rate delta, entrepreneurs are just going to sell their firms uh, and become volunteers. So, you know, we, we really think of, uh, for instance, someone like Bill Gates that disinvest in, uh, in, uh, in Microsoft and starts, uh, you know, starts having like a more diversified portfolio. Uh, another way to think about it is just death, you know, like uh, for instance, uh, uh, you know, Steve Jobs was completely uh, invested in, uh, in Apple uh, when, it, when he dies, uh, his wife uh, got a lot of his fortune and so uh, starts his investing and like investing in other, uh, um, other firms. All right, so uh, the, the model is more general in particular because firms are going to grow optimally. And so, you know, like the, the problem is really going to be the typical IFC problem. Uh, firm growth is going to be optimally chosen to maximize first value. Uh, firm's value is going to be uh, something that depends on the state of the firm, what is the current TFPS. 
and what is the current amount of capital K. And so we're going to call this uh, firm value. We can go to denote it uh, V of K, uh, indexed by S, the state of the firm. And so there's a, you know, a Hamilton HJB uh, condition uh, equation, which says that the return uh, of the firm must equal the uh, complete, um, the outflow that you get from the firm. So uh, the value of the firm multiplied by the interest rate must equal uh, uh, the cash that you get from the firm, which is uh, AS minus IG. Uh, times the total amount of capital plus uh, ITO's terms. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, because we, we chose a simple AK production technology from value is going to be proportional to capital. Uh, so V is going to be proportional to K and the, the, the ratio between the two QS, which is the market to book ratio of a firm in state S, uh, we're going to denote it QS. And so, you know, uh, we get this uh, AJB condition, which is that the interest rate must equal uh, AS minus IG divided by QS, which is the dividend yield, plus the growth rate of the tree, plus uh, the change in um, QS, which is the, the price of the tree. Uh, and so, you, yeah. Sorry, can you just explain to, to everybody briefly why, um, even if the, the owner, the entrepreneur is risk averse, you haven't I guess, mentioned that. In fact, this is the right problem for the entrepreneur to solve. I mean, it's, oh, yeah, that, just, that's, uh, it's clear, but just, just say it, I think it's helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so in our model, like investment, uh, um, uh, investment doesn't change the, um, uh, the riskiness of the firms. And so there is no way for the investor to like, you know, try to, uh, to, to get a firm that is less uh, risky by investing less. So we're just going to, uh, to, to increase uh, in, uh, investment to uh, optimally choose. In the back of the model, we have uh, you know, some kind of modular meter that says that the, the investor can completely freely um, uh, get outside capital. Uh, and so in reality, you may think that uh, you know, maybe outside capital is costly, or maybe the entrepreneur uh, you know, may not want to uh, get diluted. And so maybe that's going to screw, uh, to, you know, to, to, to change the optimal policy. Um, so in our model, we just said that, uh, we, we kind of like uh, rule that out by just saying that, uh, um, um, the, the, the firm uh, optimally invest. Um, we, we haven't, I think in reality, I think, you know, uh, there is a trade-off between investing too much and maybe like the, the, the dilution that, that, that's happening. And so, you know, that would be like an interesting thing to model, like we don't do, do that in the data. Um, we, don't, we don't do that in the model for now. Um, so, you know, part of it is just like assumptions. We, we just assume that uh, uh, there is no, uh, financial frictions. In reality, I'm sure that, you know, um, the, the extent to which uh, in entrepreneurs want to go to a side market to issue capital is not just based on maximizing firm value, but also, uh, you know, based on keeping control and uh, stuff like that. Um, all right, so, uh, that, so that's the firm's problem. Uh, so it looks exactly as uh, the style as model, but you see that the two key differences is that the uh, growth rate is optimally chosen. And uh, now you see that uh, the, the firm does produce some, some output, but you know, when the output is lower than the investment rate, uh, the, the cash flow is going to be negative. So we're going to go back to, to trees that require investment to grow. All right, so now we're going to define book wealth of an entrepreneur. Why? So book wealth is uh, the market wealth divided by uh, the, the value of the, the, the firm. And you can just see it as the amount of capital owned by the entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, in a way, instead of talking about wealth, we're going to talk about capital, like the amount of capital that is owned by the entrepreneur. Uh, it's a little bit simpler to work with book wealth rather than market wealth because uh, market, book wealth doesn't jump when the uh, firm changes from uh, one TFP to the other. Uh, but uh, it turns out that working with book wealth actually gives exactly the same results when we look at tail inequality because uh, you know, we show that the Pareto inequality is the same whether you look at inequality in book wealth or inequality in market wealth. Why? Because the ratio between the two, between book wealth and market wealth, is just equal to QS, which is something that is bounded in the setup. Uh, so, you know, instead of looking at the uh, inequality in market wealth, we just look at the inequality in like uh, capital that is owned by the entrepreneurs. So what is the evolution of capital all the entrepreneurs? It's just, uh, uh, so the dividend yield plus the growth rate of the uh, the tree minus three. Uh, and so, you know, something that is going to, we're going to, 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 to denote this growth rate mu, uh, that's going to depend on S. And so one thing that is going to be important here as in the Stalas model is how does this growth rate react to changes in interest rate? 
And so here I have uh, I've put the, the derivative of mu s respect to r. And what you see is that, uh, you know, when r changes, it's going to do two things. First, it's going to change qs because that changed the value of the firm, but also that may change uh, gs, which is the growth rate of the firm. Uh, so in the first term here, it's a derivative respect to uh, when qs changes. So when qs changes, uh, that's going, when r decreases, that, in, that tends to increase the value of the firm, which tends to um, um, uh, change the growth rate of uh, capital. So in particular, if a firm has a negative payout yield, that is AS is lower than IGS, uh, that basically means that the firm requires outside investment to grow. Um, here, um, so here uh, in this case, low rates are going to increase the growth rate of the growth. Uh, why? Because you know, firm lower rates means high valuation, high QS, uh, and when the uh, which means that the entrepreneur gets less diluted as uh, it grows. And then there is like another term that is new, which is that uh, now the, um, the the growth rate may adjust, but actually, uh, actually uh, here it doesn't really matter uh, the, the, for the growth rate of book wealth. Intuitively, uh, when R goes down, it tends to increase the growth rate of the firm, like it, it makes it easier for, for, for entrepreneurs to, to, to get outside capital. So basically they're going to grow less, but they're also going to get more diluted. And so at the first order, that doesn't change the growth rate of the, the capital that they own. Um, the only thing that matters is just through the effect of QS, the indirect effect through a change in GS doesn't really matter. Uh, and so you see that it's interesting. It really depends on, so the second term is zero. The first term, the sign of the first term really depends on the sign of the payout yield. So if, uh, if, you in a, if, you own a, if you're an entrepreneur and you own a firm that is uh, issuing equity, as we saw before, a uh, payout yield is going to be negative, And so a uh, higher R is going to decrease you, you, the growth rate of your book growth. But if you in entrepreneurs that is in a maturing firm that for instance, that is actually repurchasing shares from outside shareholders, now lower rates is going to uh, mean that when you repurchase shares from outside shareholders, you're going to uh, pay a higher price to buy them and so that's going to, to hurt you. And so there, you here, like the interesting thing is that the effect of the R uh, interest rate on the growth rate of book wealth really depends on the sign of the payout yield. All right, so in this model, we have like an arbitrary amount of, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of uh, different firms, uh, but we're still able to characterize analytically the effect of R and Pareto inequality. And uh, you know, that's actually a, a big, theoretical contribution of a paper, which, which is to show that actually it's very easy to look at the effect of a change in a parameter, here the interest rate on Pareto inequality. What we show is that the change in Pareto inequality is exactly equal to the change in the growth rate of the people that are reaching the top. Okay, so if you look at all the trajectories in the, uh, in the economy, if you look at the average growth rate of a trajectory, it's going to decrease with the, when the interest rate decreases, uh, because in average, uh, a growth rate of everyone is R. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it decreases all the trajectories. So if you look at the trajectory of people getting to the top of the world distribution, so in particular, the one in orange right now, the one that are going to reach the top, then lower R may have a positive effect, effect on, on them. In particular, we saw that for the people that, for trees that keep growing for a while, uh, lower R is going to increase uh, to reduce the extent to which they get diluted, and so that's going to increase their realized uh, growth rate. And, and so uh, the really nice thing is that uh, I show, I, we, we have a nice uh, expression for the effect of uh, interest rate on the growth rate of uh, people. And so in terms of observable moments, what it says is that the, uh, the, the, ch the effect of R and Pareto inequality is just going to be in, uh, observable, and actually it can be uh, used as a, as a sufficient statistics. The idea is to look for people that are reaching the top. So basically people like Bezos and uh, you know, uh, Zuckerberg that are reaching the top. The idea is to look at what is their um, uh, payout yields and the duration of the firm while they are like, reaching the top. And so um, uh, as, as long as the entrepreneurs that are reaching the top are own firms that are issuing equity, uh, AS minus IGS, IGS over QS, which is the payout yield is going to be negative and the uh, interest rate is going to decrease um, uh, Pareto inequality. Uh, Mathieu, sorry, uh, quick question. So you said conditioning on reaching the top or conditioning on being at the top? What, what, uh, which one is a better oh, so, phrasing? Yeah, so uh, that's a great clarification question. So uh, there are two ways to see it. Either it's, it's the current uh, net payout deal of the one reaching the top, uh, or you know, it can be seen as, you, if you look at the people at the top today, look at the past growth rate. 
while they were reaching the top. And actually that's the second one that we're going to do in the data. Just look at everyone in the top today, but look at their past growth rate rather than their current growth rate. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, all right, so, so uh, that's a sufficient statistic. Of course, uh, what we want to do is kind of extend the model a little bit more to get leverage. So, you know, we always, uh, for now, we've considered the case of a firm that, uh, of an all in equity firm for which the only way for the firm to, to raise outside funding is to raise equity. But in reality, um, you know, especially if you think about firms that stay private for a while, firms tend to uh, raise funding both by uh, issuing shares, but also only sometime only by uh, uh, raising debt, uh, you know, going to the bank and actually asking for uh, some money. And so in this case, actually the same mechanism is going to happen. I mean, uh, you know, in, like the, the core idea of our, of our paper is that, uh, you know, low rates makes it easier to get outside funding. And so uh, in particular, low rates is going to uh, reduce dilution for the firms that are, uh, you know, uh, issuing equity. But it also, you know, even if you, if you think of a firm that is, uh, you know, not, not public, but is, uh, you know, going to the bank, a lower rate means uh, that it's going to decrease, uh, you know, the amount of money that they give to debt holder, and so that's going to, to, to be more money in the pocket of uh, equity holders. Uh, and so in this case, the sufficient statistics is, uh, uh, becomes a little bit more complicated. What matters is uh, the equity payout deal uh, times the duration, so that's, uh, that's what is due to equity. And then there's also like the debt to equity. So if you think about the firms that have a zero equity payout deal, so for instance, they, 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 they're not uh, issuing us like equity, just the fact that they have some debt is going to mean that a lower rate is going to increase uh, our rate of inequality. Um, so really the key point is that both, both, uh, both uh, kind of financing uh, 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 matter. And in reality, you know, in, in the data, it's actually very uh, polarized, you know, based a lot of firms. Uh, that are uh, funded by VC for which the equity payout yield is very negative because they issue a lot of uh, finance that the debt to equity is around zero. Uh, and then in contrast, you have like a lot of firms that are, uh, you know, don't use a VC and actually have a lot of debt. Um, and so for them, it's going to be also a negative numerator. Okay, so uh, that's our sufficient statistic. And now the key idea is to look at the empirics and to, um, uh, to measure the sufficient statistic in the data. And so the idea is, to, to, is going to, to collect data on the wealth trajectory of the top and entrepreneurs. So look at the top and entrepreneurs and look at the past uh, growth rate and look at the average, uh, lifetime average equity payout yield. So how much uh, equity issuance did they do in average? What is the average debt to equity? And what is the average growth rate? And uh, by collecting all of that uh, and by imputing the duration, you know, taking a certain duration for, for the, the firms, we're going to, to calibrate duration because it's not directly observable. Uh, we're going to obtain the, the sufficient statistic by averaging the equity payout deal duration and the two equity uh, of the people getting to the top. So again, if we're going to observe that people at the top tend to have been net equity sure with a very negative equity payout deal, a very high duration, and a very negative debt to equity that is very levered, we're going to see that lower rates are going to have a huge uh, impact on a parallel inequality. Uh, so let's, uh, so what we're going to do is, uh, you know, we, we actually have to uh, measure equity payout yield of all the firms owned by top entrepreneurs in the US. So what we do is we're going to look at Forbes, uh, uh, people in the top of Forbes uh, 400, and we're going to, um, to, to measure the lifetime average equity, uh, the last time equity, sorry, the lifetime average equity payout yield and debt to equity. It's not obvious because, it, you know, it's very easy to measure equity issuance and the uh, uh, dividends once the firm is public, when, when the firm is private, actually, you know, there's not a, a lot of data. Uh, so what we're going to do is use, um, what for firms that IPO, they have to report at the ACC1 uh, the amount of um, uh, the firm that is still owned by the founders. And so, you know, if you think about, you know, uh, let's take the example of Facebook, you know, at the founding date, uh, the founders own 100% of the firm, employees own 0%, and outside investors own 0%. But as uh, you know, after like a several rounds, uh, the you know the, the firms is going to uh, issue more shares uh, to both outside investors like VCs, but also employees by paying the employee with like stocks instead of cash. And so, if you look at the IPO at the uh, uh, year of the IPO, actually founders of uh, of uh, Facebook only own like thirty percent of the firm anymore. Um, and so, usually, you know, it's a, a very simple rule of thumb is that a third, at the IPO, a third of the uh, firms are, are owned by funders, a third are owned by employees, and a third are, fund, are owned by outside investors. Uh, 
Uh, and so in particular case of uh, Facebook, because uh, you know, Facebook grew so fast, so quickly, equity pay out yield was very negative at minus uh, 11%. So that means that every period, uh, 11, there, there was an issuance of 11, every year there was an issuance of 10% of new shares, which means that every year the existing shareholders are diluted by 10%. Um, and so, it, of course, it means that, uh, you know, lower rates were very uh, nice for Mark Zuckerberg because it allowed him to uh, get all of that outside money without getting uh, that much diluted. Uh, the debt uh, to equity ratio of Facebook is basically zero. Uh, you know, Facebook uh, got some debt, but because it grew so fast, like it, without uh, reusing debt, basically debt was zero at the time of IPO. And the growth rate of wealth for Mark Zuckerberg was like 100%, like a very, very high growth rate uh, from zero, 1 million to, to 41 billion. And so we basically build these capitalization tables for all the firms that IPO uh, that are owned by people in the, in the top. And so what we obtain is this, the following table where we look at the average of these quantities across the top 50 US entrepreneurs. And what we obtain is an average equity payout yield that is negative, which means that if you look at the entrepreneurs at the top of the US, most of the time they were net equity issuers rather than net equity uh, 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 net dividend payers. Uh, so equity payout yield in average is minus 2%. Uh, so you see that this has a huge uh, heterogeneity across people. And in particular, you see like people like, uh, uh, in particular, Uber or uh, Tesla that have a very high, uh, very negative equity payout yield, like minus 16%, like in, in, in kind of like industries where you need a lot, way more funding than uh, uh, just software. Uh, you do see that some entrepreneurs uh, tend to have uh, tend to be with uh, firms that tend to have like actually given uh, equity back dividends back to to shoulders, but uh, that only concerns uh, less than a quarter of uh, people. Uh, debt to equity is forty uh, percent. That means that uh, uh, Matthew, why, why do you say less than a quarter? It looks like the the median is positive. You said yeah, most yeah, of yeah. them. Yeah. So I, I, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, uh, you're correct. Um, the skew that makes them mean negative. Yeah, uh, that's correct. Um, so the debt to equity is negative. So that's another reason why uh, lower rates are going to increase inequality. It's because uh, you know this, uh, some firms tend to uh, own some debt, and so lower rates means that uh, less money needs to be given to banks at the ex and so more money uh, is uh, is um, is kept to by uh, by the entrepreneur. Uh, so you see that, for instance, like firms that are like VC uh, funded, like Facebook, uh, they are very low debt to equity. Uh, less than 10%. In average, uh, firms tend to have like a debt to equity around 40%. And then the average growth rate is 30%, which means that, uh, you know, if you look at the average entrepreneur, uh, and if you look at the realized growth rate of the entrepreneur going to the top, it's around like 30%. Uh, again, with a maximum that was uh, by Mark Zuckerberg, actually, that grew like super fast at like 100%, uh, but in general, it's like much lower. Uh, the only thing that we need to build a sufficient debt stick is the average uh, duration of these firms. Uh, and so that's important to know by how much uh, would a decrease in R by 1% would increase the value of these firms. So we take an average duration of 30 years, which uh, corresponds to uh, the top uh, quantile of uh, uh, du uh, duration, firm's duration um, as measured by Gomson and Lazarus, looking at the realized duration of the firm's uh, uh, public firms. Uh, we, th we think of it as like a, um, a lower bound because you know this uh, this duration is the duration of firms that are already public. You know, if you look at firms that are uh, private, um, um, you know, before IPO, that you know, you may think that they have they may have an even higher duration. Uh, and so, putting everything together, uh, together we get that uh, um, the, the derivative of the Pareto hotel uh, Pareto inequality respect to the interest rate is minus three point six. What, what does that mean? That means that uh, if the interest rate goes down by one percent. Uh, what our data tells us is that a Pareto inequality goes, uh, goes up by uh, you know, 3.6%. And so just to quantify a little bit, uh, let's say that this constraint has decreased by 5% since 1980s. So here is, we just look at the uh, change in the, uh, uh, like the yield of long-term bonds, 30-year uh, treasuries. Um, so we don't consider change in the uh, equity premium, but actually you know, what matters is both the, the, the it's actually the, the, the the sum of the uh, risk-free rate and uh, the equity premium. Um, so, you know, we're just going to say, you know, let's suppose that they have decreased by 5%. You know, there's a lot of unknown around this figure, but it's a, it's a nice uh, um, uh, figure. And so, you know, how much does, can we explain for a decrease in interest rate? Well, we just uh, multiply minus 3.6, which is the effect of 1% uh, change in interest rate, multiplied by minus 5, which is uh, the um, 
overall change in discount rate during the period, and we get 18%. And so actually, if you look at uh, the rise in Pareto inequality since the 1980s, it just increased by something like uh, 25%. And so uh, that's why we conclude that uh, our decline in uh, decline in discount rates by 5% can, can extend actually uh, three quarter of the rise in Pareto inequality. Uh, so here, this measure of Pareto inequality was obtained by uh, comparing the uh, wealth of the last person in Forbes 400 compared to the average wealth of the person in Forbes 400. So it is the ratio between the wealth of the threshold divided by the average wealth of people um, that are wealthier than you. So Mathieu, can I? Um... Uh, 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 to your question about your choice of, of whom to look at in the tail. So if I understood correctly, um, is you, you selected some people, some of the rich, very richest people, um, and, and used their, their holdings because others were uh, diversified or, or, or inheritors. Or, but I'm just, just trying to, if I was trying to match this to the model, would, would these other people have been uh, already rentiers in the language of the model. And if we had let the model go on for long enough, if we, if we stay here in the sidelines, we, we won't see these people in the tail any longer uh, 50 years from now. Is that? No, no, so it's completely normal to have always rentiers at the top uh, because entrepreneurs are continuously transitioning to rentiers, right? So even though rentiers, they don't grow that fast, they always rentiers at the top because you know, they're always like entrepreneurs that are diversifying away, right? Uh, and so in a model, as in the data, that's what happened. We always see volunteers uh, uh, at the top, people that are not, uh, no, longer, uh, that are holding, no longer holding the firm, but more like a diversified. Uh, what the model tells us is that we don't need to look at what these volunteers are doing, and uh, we don't need to take them into account. As long as we're in a, in a, in a world in which, there are, uh, in, in which the right tail of the distribution, in the right tail of the distribution, we see these entrepreneurs, people getting into it, uh, we can just look at the past uh, equity issuance of these entrepreneurs and we can just throw the wrong shares. You know, intuitively, so I have like one uh, metaphor for it, so my co author doesn't like it, but you know, one, one way to think about it is like a geyser, uh, you know, like a, the waters that gets out of, the, of, the, of the, the ground. So, you know, like what matters for the height of the geyser is really like the, high, the, the speed at which the people that are getting out of the, the, the water gets out of the ground, it doesn't really matter at, you know, the speed at which like the uh, water uh, gets back to the ground. So, you know, what matters is really, what is the speed of the people that are getting to the tail, not the speed of the people once they are in the tail. And so that's why in the model, as in the data, we don't need to take into account the growth rate of volunteers, but it's completely normal that there are volunteers at the top. Uh, it's because uh, every period there are like, uh, uh, you know, some, some entrepreneurs that are transitioning to volunteers. Okay, no, sure, that's fair. But so just to be clear, your, your sufficient statistic, you could have also conditioned on not only on the wealth being very high, but also on being still an, a concentrated owner or an entrepreneur, if you, if you wish. Oh yeah, in, that form. in the data, we've only looked at entrepreneurs. No, I, I know, but in the, the, theoretically, that you could have yeah, the, yeah. your formula uh, could, could condition in addition to on being very wealthy, also on still being concentrated. Yes, uh, exactly. That's a very good point. And actually, uh, uh, you know, if you think of the, in, in, the da in the model, both give exactly the same thing. And the intuition is that as long as you look at the past growth rate, the, all, all the volunteers that you see in the top, they used to be entrepreneurs. And so, you know, it's, even if you look at volunteers, when you look at their past, they have to be uh, um, they were entrepreneurs in the past. One reason we didn't look at, at this is, you know, like in, in the data, in reality, you have like some volunteers like, uh, you know, for instance, um, uh, JP Morgan, or, you know, people like that. It's, it's, it's incredibly hard to look at the uh, growth rate and the equity issuance of uh, JP Morgan that, you know, happened to like grow a lot in the 20s and 30s. So, you know, that's uh, one reason we, we, we didn't look at these big families and the, because it was just like super hard to kind of like look at the data like 100 years ago. Uh, in the model as in the data, it's completely fine to throw them away. Uh, you know, in reality, I think, you know, maybe it should, we give something different, uh, but it's just like the data. The data is very hard, actually, just for Facebook and, and Uber. You will think that uh, we know exactly the run of financing all these big firms. It's actually not true. Uh, you know, a lot of funding uh, uh, are private, uh, and it's even harder for firms that didn't grow in the last four years. All right, so... Uh, Matthew, I think you should wrap up. Okay, uh, thank you. So, uh, I had some transition dynamics that we have in the paper. Uh, I'm not going to um, um, to, um, to, to spend much time into it. Uh, but the main idea is that, you know, as the interest rate goes down, 
uh, that's going to increase, there's going to be a short run effect of like increasing market valuation. Uh, but what's important is what happened uh, going forward. So going forward, uh, rich people that are in the top tend to have like lower returns. Uh, but that's compensated by the fact that there is like an inflow of people. So think of like people arriving in the top percentile, like Zuckerberg or Bezos, that is going to push up the top percentile and ultimately increase inequality, even though going forward, existing uh, rich people tend to have like lower returns in average. All right, so in conclusion, uh, the, the main thing that we do is that we overturn a classical result uh, that is at the heart of the wealth inequality literature, and we show that lower rates can actually increase Pareto inequality. And it's actually quantitatively significant. Uh, we find that a 5% decline in discount rates that is you know, uh, uh, consistent with the data can extend uh, three quarters of the rise in Pareto inequality. Uh, so of course, the magnitude here depends on the characteristic of the economy and something we haven't talked about, but that is very interesting to think about is that the effect of the interest rate may be different in different setups, right? So here, nowadays, we live in a world where, uh, you know, uh, there are like all these VC firms that are giving a lot of funding to like very uh, talented entrepreneurs. Uh, and so that's why we find that a lower R has like a super high effect on the wealth inequality. But if you think about, you know, other time period of the US or other countries, it may not be the case. And so uh, the effect of interest rate may be different in different countries. And so, you know, that's something that we also interest in, uh, uh, in, uh, in thinking about. All right, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Matthew, for a great presentation. Now I'll uh, hand the microphone to uh, Nikolai for a 10 minute discussion. Matthew, can you unshare your screen? All right. Well, uh, thank you very much again for, for the invitation. Um, I enjoyed the I enjoyed reading the uh, the paper, thinking about these these things. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the the basic model, maybe a little bit more about uh, the notion of inequality um, that Mathieu has has been thinking about for for years, but maybe not everybody is is as sold uh, on it and perhaps uh, familiar with it. Namely, this uh, um, thickness of the the right tail of the distribution, and then just raise a few uh, a few comments. Uh, nothing uh, special, but things that uh, I, I imagine people would uh, uh, would be interested in talking about a anyway. Um, so why is this okay? All right. So first of all, the paper consists of uh, of a model, but also a, a very interesting uh, foray into in, into the data. And the model is built around uh, an observation, uh, which is that uh, uh, you know if you can raise capital cheaply, then the NPV of your projects is is going to to go up, and what that you know, would translate uh, into would be richer uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, now, there's quite a bit uh, of way to to go until. Um, getting this fatter tail in, in particular. So as I said the paper concentrates on, on, the, on, on the shape of the extreme uh, distribution of the extreme wealth. Uh, not necessarily the, the only way to think about inequality or perhaps the way in which uh, people with, uh, with social concerns uh, in particular might, uh, uh, what might, they might focus on. But that's what, what the paper is, is, is about and that uh, makes it very um, makes it possible to have a very elegant uh, elegant model and elegant route into uh, questioning the data and uh, in, in the data uh, what the authors do is to uh, to give us a sense of what this Pareto exponent this power may have looked like at different points in time this was one of the graphs that Mathieu showed uh, where it, it went up from maybe 0 0.5 to 0 0.55, rather 0 0.7 or, or so over 20, 30 years, um, as well as um, tell us how in a specific model uh, under certain assumptions where only the interest rate in particular is going to change, how much that interest rate uh, drop in particular could have contributed or the discount rate drop 
And they found that it's possible, um, <laughs> the abstract says that it did happen that uh, the interest rate explains the, or caused this much of a, of a change. Well, at least it's possible uh, if we take the model at face value, a, a high proportion, at least 50% of that change in the, in the power in the exponent is due to the interest rate. Okay, so um, as I said, it's, you know, initially you might think, oh, it's, it's obvious, yeah, sure, interest rates are lower than if, if you have an idea, if you have, if you're an entrepreneur type person, you're going to, to, to become richer. But uh, to, to be, uh, as it, it's recognized uh, in the literature, um, in order to achieve uh, uh, truly a thick distribution of, of, uh, uh, of wealth, the, the natural mechanism, and also one that's, that strikes one as, as intuitive, as in line with, uh, with real observation, real world, is, is to go through to growth rates. So it's not a matter of being able to borrow one time at very low rates to make a, a giant program, a giant uh, project, but rather sustaining investment that's fueled by lower, uh, at, at low uh, interest rate. And how, how does this work? I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention this, this briefly, how this, this power com comes about. Um, so suppose that you have agents that join the economy at a given rate. So I try to stay as close to the notation in the paper as possible at the rate uh, eta. And they enjoy a growth in wealth, which I'm just saying here exogenously is given by a parameter called gamma. And this one goes on until uh, an exponentially distributed time. And this happens, this time arrives at the intensity delta. And thereafter, let's say the wealth doesn't grow anymore. In that case, who's going to be in, in the right tail? The people that have been, have experienced their wealth grown growing for a long time so that means people who have been born sufficiently long ago but also have had the the, the luck to not have stopped growing so in particular if you were looking for people whose wealth is um let's say larger than um is in a particular uh, level after uh, that we observe right now then these people have to have been around for, for a long enough time and they're not that, how many people are there who are, who are old enough to have possibly experienced a, a growth for long enough? Well, that's given by the, the, the rate of, of entry, or rate of population growth. And that explains this proportion here. The first one, which is uh, due to the parameter eta, this second term is just the length of time needed for the growth to occur. And then similarly, you need to have been lucky enough so that the, the parameter, uh, sorry, the, the tau uh, is, is long enough. There's no realization of your stop to, to grow. And this is what, uh, what leads to, to a power that, uh, that has, uh, might remind you of the, the one that uh, Matthew also, also showed us, which is uh, in particular driven by the growth gamma. And uh, it also features these other uh, terms. Now, okay, so how can you get a higher, a, a thicker tail? You just say, well, just increase, increase gamma. Um, in principle, this gamma could have increased for, for all sorts of reasons, uh, if, if that's what we, we, we think uh, happened, that the uh, tail became thicker for mechanisms of this, of this nature. But they also say, well, we, we think there's, there's, there's room to believe that in fact, this gamma went up, it went up because of the, the, the interest rate. And what they do is provide a, a model uh, that, that very naturally generates that, that feature. So in the, in the model in particular, this uh, investing over a sufficiently long time that uh, accumulates uh, cheaply financed growth can, um, can um, is, is akin to increasing this, this gamma. This, um, okay. So the, these are the, the formulae that, um, that Matthew also, also showed. So just to, to mention uh, uh, very briefly, the, the, this equation here is an indifference equation for, for an investor. And it says that uh, conditional on keeping to grow, so this, this last term is, doesn't exist, um, the return realized is going to be uh, a combination of the capital gains return G and then the, the dividend yield, which is, which is negative. Um, 
here. Um, and, and this term is, is larger than R, simply because when the firm stops growing, Q is going to, to drop. So this uh, capital gain term here at the end is, is, is negative when it is realized. That, that's an expectation term. So, so that gives, so it's possible that, uh, that the entrepreneurs are the ones that become richer. That's not, uh, not surprising. What, what's the main point is that in fact, this, this growth, this conditional growth can be decre is decreasing in, with, with, with the interest rate. It turns out in this very simple model, it's also a linear uh, function of, of the interest rate. But basically, since Q is going to be um, uh, increasing with, with R, um, then this, this whole term here is going to also be monotonic in R. And actually, sorry, is I, I missed, missed wrong. Q is decreasing in R, and therefore this whole term here is, is also decreasing in, in R. And in, in fact, um, it, it's enough with this model, you can already pretty much generate the, this called the, the sufficient statistic that the authors looked at. Um, and it, it strikes me as the, the general model gives us comfort of, of robustness more than, than additional things to, to do in terms of working with, uh, with, with the model. Um, so let me ask a, a, few, a few questions. And these are things that uh, perhaps people will, will, will pick on um, in, in the discussion uh, that follows. So first of all, uh, actually, I don't have much to say, but I'm not sure whether anybody would want to, to raise it. I, uh, Matteo was very clear. He was concerned about how the extreme right tail looks, and, and that's it. And in itself, that's, that's a fine question. Other people have, have other concerns when, when talking about uh, inequality. And while the Pareto uh, features can, are, are easy to, easier to work with and, and understand them mathematically, and also given some of the data on Forbes, perhaps also look at empirically, um, how does it relate to other, other notions that people are, are worried about? Um, I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure whether that maybe Mathieu and, uh, and Emilian have, uh, have uh, further thoughts and, uh, about this. And then there are a few, a few comments or a few thoughts that, that come up that will lead to, to, to the, the big question that I think everybody has on, on, on their mind. Namely, what other things are happening in the economy at, at, at the same time? So one, one small observation is that what matters here is not the interest rate, of course, it's the, the, the expected return on, on, these, uh, on these investments, on, on these firms. And they may or may not be the same as the, the market equity premium. And in fact, they may not have changed over time as the market equity premium. So the entire, sorry, entire equity expected return has. So the interest rate has gone down. What happened to the equity premium? And here I, I just give an example motivated by some work uh, that you know, over time with Stavros and other people we, we, we've done. In particular, if you imagine that, and uh, you didn't have time to talk about it, or the notion of displacement, but if we, if we think that because of technological advances or changes and, and, and other factors, the displacement, the potential for displacement has gone up. That could on one hand make existing equities more risky and therefore a higher equity premium on the market, but also push down interest rate and even the risk premium on, on new, new firms. So this would go in, in the other direction, would create an even bigger drop in, in, the, in the returns. But one could disagree with the premise that, that I listed here. Um, another observation is that if the interest rates are lower, that could also uh, bring in more uh, entrepreneurship. And depending on how, how we model this, this may or may not affect the Pareto exponent. But you'd expect that it would, it would increase most likely inequality in that there would be inequality in a, in a broader sense, perhaps in top 1%, 10%, uh, et cetera. Um, and, and then finally, you know, what, what all this is leading is to say that uh, uh, over this period, 85 to 2015, a lot of things changed, not only uh, interest rates. They also say somewhere we don't take a stance on, on this. It could be anything. It's not clear to me that it, it, the implications are the same. Uh, secular stagnation presumably is, is something to do with a lower, lower growth rate. If it is purely due to the growth rate that interest rates have gone down, then I think the results 
do, do not obtain as, as, as written. But the, the bigger point is simply that, uh, just like uh, I think uh, Chad Jones wrote in, in, in the context of his discussion of uh, Piketty and, and uh, Piketty's work, Piketty size, uh, et cetera, they are, where the R minus G was the, the main uh, point uh, of attention that a lot of things could happen to, to that quantity depending on, on the, the, the full general equilibrium model. So there's something definitely left to, to, to discuss. And finally, uh, one observation that I think has to, has to be made, and Mathieu has to tell us more about it, is if we're talking about tails, I mean, how long does it take for these tails to, to change shape? There's one, the one thing to say the interest rate was 5% or whatever it was in 1990, and it may be 1% uh, 25 years later. Does, does that drop uh, over that period the result already in a tail that's recognizably uh, uh, different? Uh, it, it's already at the limit 20 years later. So I, I think I'm, I'm way over time, right? So I, I'll probably um, uh, stop here. Uh, rather than show you more more graphs that are just from from the paper here was just comparing uh, I can just leave it on as I, as I stop um, the, the, both from the, the the drop in in interest rate and the measure Pareto inequality okay so I'm going to should I stop sharing or do you prefer that I I, I leave this on I'll just stop I don't hear you. Mariam, I'm on mute. Mariam, I'm mute. No. Okay. okay, sorry. So thanks, Nikolai, for the great um, discussion. So now what we're going to do is that we're going to collect three questions, and then I'm going to pass the mic to Matthew to answer, uh, to Matthew to answer like both the discussion and the question. So the first question comes from Kenneth Ahern from USC. Hi, I have two quick questions. Um, the first question is about the delta in your stylized model. That's, that's kind of what I see as new compared to the Piketty stuff, which is uh, your market to book value is um, a function of that delta. And as the delta goes up, the market to book goes up. So instead of having R minus G, you have R minus G plus delta. So I was curious if that's changed over time, what, what would lead that to change? The second question was about um, the dilution that you talk about, if, if, the, um, if the assets that the firm is receiving when they issue new shares is fairly priced, then the, the value, the cash flow rights of the existing owners doesn't change. The control rights do. They won't be able to vote uh, with the same power, but they will have the same value of uh, shares. So I was wondering if you could address that. Thanks. Um, okay, great. Thank you. So the second question comes from Jeffrey Zhang from NYU Shanghai. Jeffrey, please. Uh, thanks, Miriam. Um, my question was asking the authors if they could talk a little bit about sort of this, this topic that Nikolai raised, the endogeneity of R to growth rates and such. So, I mean, when we think about very large declines in interest rates, one of the large ex examples to me would be uh, Japan for the last couple of decades. And to my knowledge, we haven't seen a great increase in wealth inequality in Japan. And so uh, I suppose that this must be due to something like lower displacement or lower entry of new firms in Japan. But I'd like to hear what the authors have to say about it. Uh, okay, great. So our last question is from Sylvain Catherine at Wharton. Sylvain, please. Uh, hi, uh, great paper. Uh, yes, my uh, comment was related to uh, something that uh, Nicolas said about like the free entry of entrepreneurs. So my understanding is that if you have free entry, uh, on expectation, you should have like the same profit for an entrepreneur, uh, but the variance might be larger because if they are less diluted, those that are lucky will uh, keep most of, the, most, of their, uh, most of their luck for themselves. So is it like something that we see in the data? Is it true that like if we follow a cohort of entrepreneurs, we will see more inequality within entrepreneurs now than in the past? Um, okay, great. So now Matthew, uh, please take the last five minutes to answer the questions in any order that you find. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks everyone for these uh, super high quality comments. Uh, it's uh, really, um, really nice. Um, okay, so I'll start uh, to talk a little bit about the discussion by Nicolai that was, uh, you know, uh, great. I think uh, Nicolai has like a, a lot of papers actually looking at the effect of interest rate between entrepreneurs and uh, uh, volunteers. And, you know, as, as you said, I think like the, the key thing is that uh, in, in a model, like the effect of the interest rate is not just when you, uh, when you're born or when you sell your firm like in one time but it's really about the continuous growth and so uh, that's really like the difference between the uh, the, um, the contribution of a paper compared to to, to the literature uh, as for Pareto inequality yeah so we focus on Pareto inequality um, I, you know i will be a little bit uh, I, I think it's motivated by the data i don't think you know you, you kind of said oh it's motivated by the math like it makes it everything easier like when you look at the data most of the rise in top of inequality is focus is really concentrated at the very top uh, it's really the top 0 0.01% that increased a lot. If you look at, you know, the top uh, 1%, top 10% to 1% is like nothing. 1% to 0.01% is not, it didn't increase that much. Um, so, you know, that's why we really focus on, on Pareto inequality. Another reason is that then if you, you know, suppose for like social reason you're interested in the top 1%, it becomes very hard to define exactly what you define uh, wealth and, you know, actually Sylvain has like a paper showing that, you know, depending on how you um, um, capitalize, um, uh, you know, labor income or like uh, social security uh, income, you're going to have like different measure of inequality. So product inequality is also, is not only uh, something that we see in the data, like most of the rise in, is, is driven by the top 0 0.1%, but also it's something that is less sensitive to how you, we measure like uh, human capital, because we, it's not like the difference between the top 0 0.1% and the top 0 0.1% is about social security benefits. Um, I guess like the second kind of question is about like the, the, the idea of general equilibrium and partial derivative. Uh, so, you know, like it's true that we just look at uh, exogenous change in the interest rate, and uh, it's completely, we, 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 we remain agnostic about what changed the interest rate. Uh, it could be anything that is not, uh, doesn't appear in a sufficient statistic. Um, um, that being said, you know, it's completely possible that displacement by itself can uh, change the interest rate. Uh, you know, um, you know I, I wrote paper, but there's a lot of papers about like the impact of inequality on the interest rate. I think what we wanted it to focus in this model is the reverse uh, idea, and in particular, you know, really focus on you know one part of the story, which is what is the what is the effect of interest rate on inequality. And you know, I think going forward, what we really would like to see is more models that kind of like uh, have a combined effect of both uh, the effect of interest rate on inequality and inequality on the interest rate. Just to make us to make our point and as clear as possible, we focused on uh, exogenous effect on interest rate in a model it corresponds to a, you know, a partial derivative. You know, if you think about you know, something else change, uh, then this thing change the interest rate. What we still measure is uh, what is the you know, effect of the change in the interest rate, like the partial derivative of inequality respect to interest rate. It's still like a nice thing to measure, uh, but in reality, I'm sure that a lot of things change and in particular, it matters when we, uh, you know, when we want to extend the whole rise in inequality. I guess what we want to say is that quantitatively, it's very important. It's true that it may not be the only thing you know, mattering for wealth inequality and in particular your technology, maybe like other forces. Uh, uh, you know, another question is how long does it take? Actually, it, it's like the, uh, the, the, the convergence to Pareto detail is actually very fast in this model. We, we actually going to show more of this in the paper that we haven't shown uh, right now. Um, no, but the, the dilution. Uh, um, so, you know, one thing that is important is at, at, at which terms does the dilution happen? So suppose, for instance, you need to raise like $1 million. And suppose the price of your firm is infinite, then to raise like $1 million, it's very easy for you. You don't need to get diluted at all. Uh, now, if the price of the firm is only $1, you're going to, to, to need to get like super diluted. And so it's through this margin that the, the terms of dilution matters for the growth rate of the entrepreneurs. Uh, Jeff, a question about Japan. Why didn't we see an increase in equality in Japan? It, it's, a, it's a good question. I, I think, you know, the, 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 the financing is very different. I, I think that's what a little bit what I was saying in conclusion is that, you know, different countries may be very different. And in, in particular, it's not always the case that uh, top performing firms are like raising a lot of outside cash. And so this thing can, can, can matter across uh, countries. And Sylvain has like a, you know, perfect uh, good thing. It's just very hard for us to Look at the to, to to look at a cohort and look at all the losers. So we focus on the winners, but you know, you you insight is exactly what's happening in the model. Uh, but it's just hard to to look at the new data. Um, okay, thanks so much, Matthew, for being brief and handling all the questions. And thanks so much, Nikolai, and to all the participants. We are very happy to see you all, and uh, we are looking forward to see you to see all of you uh, next week uh, to listen to our uh, next speaker, Maurice Leno from uh, Princeton. 
uh, who will talk about global risk, uh, global price of risk, and Itamar, the wrestler from uh, Wartman, to discuss it. Thank you guys for coming. Bye bye. Thanks.